you, Eileen, and thanks again to the LSC for hosting yet another Scrambling for Safety. It's been 15 years we've been running these events. Simon Dave Schmidt with the idea back in 1996, and uh, so our first event was 1997, dealing with uh, the then Tory government's policy on key escrow. Anybody remembers that? Uh, we had about 500 people in the old theater uh, on such an arcane issue that we were surprised it was successful. Unfortunately, 15 years later, we're still running these events dealing with various policies, dealing with communication surveillance, but it's nice to see the strength of the audience continues. The, you, we have an exciting set of panels today, but we felt that in order to orient everyone around the policy, that we'd spend uh, a little bit of time now and a little bit of time after the break discussing the policy in detail, as much as we are aware of it, so that we're all speaking off the same page. Uh, the Home Office has been expert over the years on attacking people for not understanding the policy. Uh, and it's aided by the fact that they never tell you what the policy <laughs> is. Uh, so let's just make sure we're all on the same page here. So this, this very short presentation covers basically CCDP 101, or since we're at the LSC, the Social Construction and Communication Surveillance. So the history of policy when it comes to communication surveillance is a pretty simple history. Back in the old days, it was a mess. You basically had uh, government running telecommunications networks, or there was a monopoly over telecommunications networks, and access was unregulated. Even though they were highly regulated industries, access by law enforcement agencies was highly unregulated. And then they got access over time, whether it was through pen registers to begin with, but eventually through laws, they got access to communications data because it was there. If they went to BT, if they went to AT&T, or to any uh, landline provider across Europe, the data was there to get access to who was calling who and when. Then technology changed. And Bill Clinton came up with a clever idea back in 1994 saying, no matter what the technology is, as technology changes and as new forms of telecommunications come into play, he passed the law, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, that said, regardless of the telecommunications infrastructure, there must be an ability for law enforcement to gain access. And they subsidized $500 million to American industry in order to do this. The Europeans did this slightly differently, in which they made the standard for the European Telecommunications Standards Institute that there must be lawful access capabilities in all telecommunications kit built within Europe according to standards. Then came the next generation, what we call the European disease. If there is data held by telecommunications companies, that's fine. But what they wanted to ensure was that data continued to be available after those telecommunications companies no longer needed it. And this is the policy of data retention. It was passed in this country in 2001, December 2001, the Terrorism and Crime Security Act. And then Charles Clark traveled to Europe right after the London bombings and managed to get that policy pushed through the European Parliament. <coughs> So now up to two years' worth of data is held by telecommunications companies across Europe. So that is the current framework of law, or generally the situation. I'm down with this up and we'll get into greater detail. But let's talk about what is being discussed now, and that is modernizing. It's taking the leap that Clinton did and taking it a hell of a lot further. The Home Secretary in 2008, and I'm not using any names of individuals anymore, it doesn't matter. I think that's what's coming out more than anything. It doesn't matter who is saying it from which party. It matters which position is saying it. So the Home Secretary in 2008 said, look, all we're trying to do is to maintain our capabilities. Maintain the capabilities of law enforcement agencies to get access to information and to ensure that this, continue, this capability continues to exist. And so it's no surprise, in 2011, the Home Office Minister said, pretty much the same thing. It's to preserve the existing ability of law enforcement agencies. So in their minds, there are no new powers being discussed. It's all about preservation or update, or what was previously called modernization. And this was articulated most recently by the Deputy Prime Minister, which is, it is all about updating the rules and getting access to the new forms of communication that we undertake. And the example that was given here, it was Skype. So what happened? In 2008, the government introduced the Interception Modernization Program. It had been uh, simmering since 2006, 
but they started talking about it a little bit more publicly in 2008. It was targeted ISVs, including mobile phone companies. There was this idea of a central database where all the data flowing through these ISVs, the key communication data would be pulled out, and it would be stored in a central store, probably run by GCHQ. Uh, the point was to monitor all third-party services that are, that is Twitter, Facebook, Google Mail, Webmail generally, uh, possibly even Skype, that was, that was being discussed. And these, this would be enabled through ISPs to, um, deploying black boxes that would presumably be operated by GCHQ. So that's 2008. 2009 came along, and there was a significant change, dropping of the central store. Actually, that's about all that changed. Uh, dropping of the central database. GCHQ was no longer going to be responsible for maintaining this data. It was all going to be held at the ISPs. This point is key for the current political debate. 2009, the database was dropped. 2009. I can't say that enough. Because what's been happening in the, in the political debate is, as I, I was saying, about the myths, like the Home Office claims we keep on making, uh, we have misunderstandings of the policy. They do that intentionally. It's a very good debating class strategy. Because in 2008, when the policy came out, and there was a slight uproar, the Home Secretary responded saying, look, look, we're, we're not talking about content. You're wrong. We're not talking about content. We never said anything about content. But the talking points for the Home Secretary was, oh, look, everybody's got it wrong. They think we're talking about uh, recording all conversations, recording all emails, and uh, keeping this on uh, central store, that we are not touching your communications content. So that was in 2008. You would think that point would get through, but in 2012, again, you have well, this time the Deputy Prime Minister saying, look, this is not about reading people's emails. This is not about content. Nobody's saying it's about content. But they want to make it sound like we're saying it's about content. And the, uh, the minister responsible for the policy this time around, again, makes the point. It's not about the content of the calls or the emails, but it never has been. And, I, uh, and uh, the presentation is actually that Peter Stein is going to go on about what it really is about when it comes to the data that is implicated. Second point of misdirection is it's not about a central database. This was stated in 2009 by the Home Secretary, saying, look, there are absolutely no plans for a single central store. This was abandoned in 2009. No single database. It's restated by the Home Office consultation policy, saying, look, there are some serious problems with the idea of a central database. Even we accept that, says the Home Office. So therefore, we do not intend to pursue it, says the Home Office in 2009. Prime Minister, 2010, saying, well, look, this has nothing to do with the central database, not like the last government. But there was no central database for that. Anyways, <laughs> in 2012, again, this is not about a Big Brother database. We never said it was about a Big Brother database. We all know that was abandoned in uh, 2009, or 2008, 2009. So it's, 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 I did an interview with Jackie Smith on LBC a few weeks ago. We had a good laugh about the fact that the current government's trying to claim credit for her decision to get rid of the central database. They're saying, oh, well, at least we did that. So, no, that was accomplished in 2009. So why are we throwing all these quotations out here? Does it matter what is actually being said by the policy makers? And that's a legitimate question, considering we've been running scouting for safety since the Tory government back in 1996, 1997. There's been a number of elections. There's been a number of changes of people in power. <coughs> yet a lot of these policies continue. So does it matter what's actually being said? I would say that it's what, what is being said should, be, should hold people to account. When the government was proposing, after September the 11th, when the government was proposing that all telecommunications companies retain communications data in case they're of interest to law enforcement at some point in the future, they were trying to say this is not a massive deal. This is not a big step. This is not a significant change in civil liberties in this country. It's not a big change in telecommunications policy in this country. Because all we're doing, they say very clearly, is to ask them to keep the data that they already collect. We're not asking them to collect more information, says the Home Office Minister back in 2001. In 2005, when Charles Clark gave a speech at the European Parliament telling them, pass data retention for the European Union or we will take power away from the European Parliament, 
He said, look, we're not asking for something huge. All that we're asking is that it be retained and made available to law enforcement under national law. We're not asking for the collection of new information. Except in 2009, they said, well, look, we're asking for the collection of new information now. There were political settlements in 2001. There's a political settlement in 2005 in Brussels saying no new information. And now they're changing the boundaries. Now they're changing the initial conditions. This is a very important point. So they're saying, yes, we admit, we want you to capture new data. And then the Home Office in 2009 said, uh, well, actually, we also want you to retain new data. So again, a new power, a new requirement that is well beyond what is required by the law. These are significant changes in the law. And not just do they have to, do ISPs have to collect new data and retain new data, but in 2009, what was being proposed was that they should order this data and process this data so it could be readily accessed by law enforcement agencies. So it is really about imposing a duty upon telecommunications companies in a way that has never previously existed. And so, that's 2009. In 2009, through the LSE, uh, we did a consultation amongst technology experts, industry experts, and even regulators. And we, we summarized all of that, that analysis in a report that was written for the policy engagement project of the LSE that analyzed the 2009 proposal. Uh, that was pre 2009 that we led that initiative. And so now, I recommend you first read that because we have to ask, what is the policy now? Well, the policy is three steps. First, claim that the previous policy was abandoned, even though it really hasn't been. Second step, place foreign third party providers under RIPA. That is, from our understanding of, of the briefings that have been shared, the secret briefings that have been shared, is that the original proposal of IMP was flat boxes of ISPs and they would record all your webmail conversations. They would uh, record all your, I guess, tw uh, Twitter and Facebook communications interactions. This new proposal says, Actually, we're going to make Facebook and Google have to fall under RIPA, under the regulation of the investigatory powers Act 2000. So Facebook and Google will have to respond to requests from the police the same way O2 and BT and other providers in this country have to respond to requests. So that's for the Facebooks and the Googles. But for the, the non-Facebooks and the Googles, the ones who don't want to play by British law, we're going to have to go back to the 2009 proposals and place black boxes at ISPs to record communications data as it goes through the network. That, to our understanding, is the current state of the policy. We are expecting news within a week and a half. We do, uh, there's a Home Affairs Committee meeting uh, next week where we hope some more of this will be fleshed out. But I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page because if we get, if even somebody by accident says this is about communications content, the Home Office is going to thumb on us. If we even accidentally mention a central database, the coalition government will say, hey, we're, we're victorious. We, we, we're not doing that anymore. So we have to get the terms of this discussion very carefully phrased. Uh, the PLI website has an FAQ on the issue and a number of news items on the issue of CCDP. You can just search our site for CCTV. Any questions before we move on to the first panel? Uh, as you all have picked up, there is a, a very public argument going on within government at the moment about how to proceed, uh, possibly whether to proceed, uh, on the communications database issues and I think that that public argument has been brought forward I think rather than uh, triggered by the, the leak that appeared uh, in the papers clearly that argument would have happened uh, at some point uh, once the, uh, the any bill or any any proposals had had been formally uh, formally launched I, I, I guess the leak has been helpful in actually bringing forward uh, the argument so there's a better opportunity to uh, to influence the outcome uh, than there would have been if something had been put down on paper. Now what I've been asked to, uh, to talk about is, is some of the issues and, uh, and clearly some of them have been referred to by, by Chris and other, other speakers. 
Um, there is an issue around uh, RIPA and the way the existing uh, systems are operating and the, 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 the range of organisations that can access uh, data, as you'll be familiar, is very extensive and includes organisations that perhaps you'd expect to be able to access communications data, but also others that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to expect to access data. So clearly there is an issue that needs to be resolved in terms of RIPA. There has been some improvements uh, in relation to uh, local authority accessing uh, communications data in the Protection of Freedoms Bill. But there's much more, I think, that needs to be done. And if there is going to be uh, any, uh, any technological changes made in relation to uh, Facebook or, or Skype or any other uh, media, then I think the, the quid pro quo would have to be a tightening up of RIPA and the other controls that apply uh, to accessing the, uh, the, the data. So in terms of perhaps other issues that, uh, that are being discussed at the moment, Obviously, cost cost is an issue. Uh, cost is an issue both in terms of making any adjustments that uh, might uh, be proposed in relation to any existing technologies, but of course there are future costs that would be derived from any uh, future technological developments. The issue of uh, content versus uh, the, the header information about uh, or which contains the comms data, I'm sure that for those of you who were here earlier with Julian Huppert, a colleague of mine, I'm sure he will have uh, dwell on that at, uh, at some length and will have uh, drawn to, the, to, to your attention the, the, uh, the meeting next week that he's organising with Facebook and others represented really to try to get to the bottom of whether in practice it is possible to uh, unpack one without, without the other and that's, that's a very hot, uh, hot debate within uh, government at the moment as well. Security remains an issue. And I think there are, there is a difference, I, I, I guess probably you as an audience wouldn't think it was a significant one, between the original proposals about uh, a centralised database as opposed to uh, requiring uh, individual ISPs and others to, to, to hold that data uh, themselves. I think that is a, uh, that, that does mean that yes, there are security issues and we know that, we know uh, we know, we all know of examples of uh, employees of telecoms companies selling on databases uh, for commercial reasons. Clearly, if there are people who are willing to do that, they may be willing to do it uh, for other purposes as well. Um, so there are security issues to, to address in terms of hacking or, or insider uh, operations. So all of those things are, are things that are now very actively uh, being discussed uh, within the coalition. And... And I hope that as a result of those discussions that what, it, what emerges uh, will be much more palatable uh, than what was originally mooted, although of course what was originally mooted in the, in the articles was not actually based on anything uh, that was, that was uh, available and wasn't based, uh, as far as I'm aware, on, on an actual bill. So I think it was, it was to some extent speculation about what was being proposed. So has there been any progress since that uh, since that uh, leak. Well, I suppose the, the, the one piece of progress that there has definitely been is that the, it is now very clear that there will be pre-legislative scrutiny, so all of the organisations represented here uh, now have a, a much better opportunity to input into that process and influence that process than might have been the case uh, otherwise. And although I don't know what's in the Queen's speech, certainly there is a very strong push to try to ensure that the the National Crime Agency proposals, which have got to come forward uh, because we're creating a National Crime Agency, uh, ideally we want to see disconnected from this issue uh, because then if it's not, then you get into arguments about, well, the National Crime Agency is a very positive thing that we want to do. This isn't at all positive, but if you object to one, then you're objecting to the other and it, uh, and it, it creates uh, significant management problems. So hopefully, uh, those two can be disconnected and then politically I think it means that National Crime Agency, which is something that uh, we do support, can go through uh, without, uh, without too, much, uh, too many complications, whereas this issue, if it is separate, then I think it provides a much greater opportunity for the parliamentary scrutiny. So I will stop there and uh, very happy to uh, field any questions if anyone's got any. Right.